this quarter is mine. Yeah, it's yours. Uh, good evening. Uh, now, actually, the topic we're dealing with is uh, the family of God, the church. And the title of uh, the study booklets our sermon series is based on is aptly called God's Family. Uh, it's a label what we often call in our English Bibles render the church, so what we mean by God's people. The general word in the Bible in its usual sense is the meaning of an assembly of people. Uh, so all of God's people are a community. I know that mostly everyone here general, generally understands what we call the church to mean the collective body of believers in Christ. I do believe seeing the church as God's family is the prominent idea that we should have. I admit I, and I'm just speaking on behalf of myself, no one else, but I wish there was another term we could use to replace the word church in the Bible because it's so loaded with connotations in our psyche through pop culture and various images that may have been implanted in our minds through our various upbringings and seeing church buildings on the street corner and so forth. And so if we're in the car with someone more familiar with a region than us, a person will say, over there is the Catholic Church, and over there is the, insert, Macedonian, Serbian, Russian Orthodox Church, and over there is the Anglican Church, and so forth. And dare I say it, there is a sense, really, that the buildings are sort of seen in the same vein as other religious type buildings like the Islamic mosques, the Buddhist temple and so forth. At least from, at least from the vantage point I would imagine uh, from outsiders of the Christian community. The church building of this or that sect or denomination is like just every other religious building. And people have religious associations of Christianity like stained glass windows, basilicas, vestments, holy water, and all these things, none of which ought to be the, or should be the impressions that, uh, that they have if we compare the word that's used in Scripture to describe God's people, us as believers. It's not the message that we should be sending unbelievers. But I also think it affects us as Christians too, the way <laughs> we see, uh, we often think of this term. And so this isn't to criticise any particular denomination of Christianity, but when we associate buildings or denominations with the biblical idea of church, it's a misleading picture. Denominations also reflect our distinctives and preferences, also implying the things that we don't like as well. So, for example, you know, what do you think the Baptists are quite keen on? Anglicans? Anglican means England, so there's a certain fondness for a certain country in the world. Um, the denomination I'm from in my hometown uh, is called Presbyterian. Do you know what that means? The elder. It's the elders. So, it's the, so this is the message that we send to unbelievers for the first time. What, what's your church? It's the elders. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Jesus is not coming back for the label of our preferences or any physical building. He is coming back to those who have opened their heart to him and belong to him. So I think it's best that we orient our focus to think rightly about this topic. So seeing us as God's family should be prominent in our minds. We are part of God's family. We belong to him. We are adopted as children into his family. And Christ can be likened to our big brother. He is the firstborn from the dead, the new Adam, the first fruits of the resurrection harvest, and we'll join him in the end in like manner. Christ is the high priest, as Hebrews says, borrowing, borrowing from the imagery of the Old Testament. But we also are priests in him and offer our lives to God as a living sacrifice. Uh, now, there, there are a few different metaphors to describe God's people. We are the body of Christ, and Christ is the head of his body. He is he's the head. He's in charge. 
The other prominent picture is we are God's temple. And this, of course, builds on what uh, God's temple symbolised for the people of the Old Testament until the time of Jesus. Uh, Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 2. Come as living stones and let yourselves be used in building the spiritual temple where you'll serve as holy priests to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. And then a bit further below. But you are the chosen race, the king's priest, the holy nation, God's own people chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvellous light. Uh, both pictures of temple and priesthood are used here, which of course are related pictures. The priesthood functioned within the temple. Notice also it's, it's not a static temple. When, when you think of a, a building, you think of something static, but this is being built up, it's progressing, it's growing. The temple symbolised the place where God dwelt among his people. So if we are the temple, God is indwelling us. So it's a far more intimate reality of God's presence among us now, isn't it? He's residing in all of us. So I know I've already touched on the general concept of what the Bible means by church and have taken it for granted you have a general understanding of this. Let's uh, start by looking at what the Bible says um, further about what, what it has to say about the church and how this topic then matters for us as believers. We can say this, God's church is both universal and it's local. There are many individual assemblies of God's people. So everyone here tonight is one such collective body. Most of the New Testament letters are addressed to individual Christian communities. So Paul will say to the church or to the holy ones in Ephesus, in Rome, Thessalonica or Colossus, etc. The reality of belonging to an individual community is important when we want to think about how we function together in service, which we'll look at later. But let's... Uh, first reflect more on the universal reality of the church and the significance of that, which is made up of believers of all time across the entire world. Now God has always reserved a people for himself. He, be he began a people for Abraham, who eventually became Israel, the nation. And Israel was called to be distinct among the nations. That meant that they had certain privileges and rights that the nations didn't enjoy. Of course, with those privileges came great responsibilities, and we know that they were not always well kept by Israel. However, God's purpose was always to bless the nations through Abraham's descendants. So until Christ came, aside from some rare examples of Gentiles, that is non-Israelite, being grafted and blessed, like, uh, for example, uh, what comes to mind, uh, Rahab or Ruth, or um, the, Jesus points out how in a time of apostasy of Israel's history, um, it was nah Nahum who was blessed, rather than uh, any of God's fellow people. But generally speaking, until Christ came, by and large, the nations were missing out on the wonderful blessings of God. And Paul himself, who was a, a zealous uh, Jewish Pharisee, who initial, initially persecuted the new followers of Jesus before God corrected him and sent him to proclaim a message of peace to all the nations, captures this reality when he writes to the Ephesian Christian community. So he says, You Gentiles, that is non Jewish people, by birth, called the uncircumcised by the Jews, who call themselves the circumcised, which refers to what men do to their bodies, remember what you were in the past. At that time you were apart from Christ, you were foreigners, and did not belong to God's chosen people. You had no part in the covenants, which were based on God's promises to his people, and you lived in this world without hope and without God. 
But now, in union with Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought us peace by making Jews and Gentiles one people. With his own body, he broke down the wall that separated them and kept them enemies. He abolished the Jewish law with its commandments and rules in order to create out of two races one new people in union with himself. In this way, making peace. By his death on the, on the cross, Christ destroyed their enmity. By means of the cross, he united both races into one body and brought them back to God. So Christ came and preached the good news of peace to all, to you Gentiles who were far away from God and to the Jews who were near to him. It is through Christ that all of us, Jews and Gentiles, are able to come in one spirit into the presence of the Father. So then you Gentiles are not foreigners or strangers any longer. You are now citizens together with God's people and members of the family of God. Do you, do you see that? And then he goes on to say, You too are being built up upon the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. He is the one who holds the whole building together. Notice again the temple imagery here, and previously he was using the body imagery. And make it grow into a sacred temple, dedicated to the Lord in union with him. You too are being built together with all the others into a place where God lives through his spirit. So what a wonderful picture this is. When Paul talks about you who were far, but now are brought near through the message of peace preached, he's alluding to many passages in Isaiah. So the idea that the Gentiles would be blessed through Israel, that itself was not such a controversial idea. But God's plan for the church, we learn, though it was partly anticipated, was also a mystery that had now been revealed. So in the very next chapter, Paul goes on to say, God revealed his secret plan and made it known to me. I've written briefly about this, and if you will read what I've written, you can learn about my understanding of the secret of Christ. In past times, uh, human beings were not told this secret, but God has revealed it now by his Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. The secret is that by means of the gospel, the Gentiles have a part with the Jews in God's blessings. They are members of the same body and share in the promises that God made through Christ Jesus. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking the Gentiles the good news and about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. God did this according to his eternal purpose, which he achieved through Christ Jesus our Lord, in union with Christ and through our faith in him, we have the boldness to go into God's presence with confidence. So there's a lot that can be said here, and we can't capture all of it because it's really profound, everything that's being said here. God's idea of the church was a grand one, to say the least. And Paul, Paul says how God was showing off to the angelic world Look what I can do. Here is the important point. Even though the idea of God's uh, blessing the rest of the nations was not an entirely a new idea to the pious Israelite, what was shocking, what was shocking was the, that God intended equal blessings for all who would believe in Christ. Paul described himself as the apostle to the Gentiles. The Ephesian church themselves had benefited from this grace. And it's likely, given the substance of the letter, that they had both uh, Greeks and Jews among them. And Paul wants them to know that one is not superior to the other. 
And that is what is meant by secret or mystery, that all the nations could enjoy the full blessings and equal status among God's people. On the other hand, as surprising as this reality may have been, Peter, when he witnessed Gentiles receiving the gift of the Spirit, could say, well, you know what? The the Scriptures do say that God is no respecter of persons. Now, what matters to God is not some group. He is not concerned. What he is concerned about is the heart of people. So if these people have generally given their lives to Christ, why would God not be merciful? Because that's what God is like. If people are going to open their lives to Christ, then he's going to welcome them in. The gospel is a message of peace and reconciliation before God and among each other. And so the uh, implication of all this is there should be peace among us. Now, some of us here are involved in missionary work among uh, particular groups of people, which is great because the reality is people are often tightly grouped together within cultural identities. But the reality that all believers are equally valuable in God's sight must be at the forefront of our minds and our approach. The gospel is meant to bring peace among us. Union with God is also union with each other. There should be a spirit of cooperation among us so that we should not be succumbing to pedantic attitudes of bitterness and resentment towards our fellow brothers and sisters of other cultural backgrounds so we can treat each other with love and dignity. And while it is reasonable for all of us to identify positively in our cultural heritages, after all, the Bible does celebrate it, you know, the fact that at the end of um, uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the Bible in the Book of Revelation, you, you will see that at the end there will be a company of people from every tribe, nation, and language before God's throne. So the cultural identities are fine, but our commitment to each other as believers in Christ trumps all other commitments. Tribalism is endemic to humanity. We fight and quarrel over really petty things and in turn do unspeakable harm to others in the name of these tribal identities. It should not be so. Are you really not going to love a fellow born-again believer because of his or her birth location or cultural heritage? I realise I run the risk of touching on this topic superficially, But listen, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He has broken down these stupid hostilities, whether Jew or Greek, Jew or Arab, Macedonian or Albanian, colour and so forth. We're all one in Christ. How can we even get into the nitty-gritty of serving as the body using spiritual gifts together if we can't even get this part right? So the idea of Christ's community promotes peace. What else does the church signify? I believe a key idea we should derive from God's community is that God is relational. And we in turn, as humans, are relational. God is our Heavenly Father. He treats us with love and compassion as children. And we are called to pray to him. We relate to God personally. We are gifted with the Holy Spirit who unites us in fellowship with God and Christ. We belong to a family, as I've already alluded to. So building on this point, we can then add this. We grow together. We don't grow alone. Now, we're all responsible for our own lives before God. So I can't believe for you, you can't believe for me. We all stand before God as individuals. And we all have individual dignity. But it's also our responsibility to grow with the help and nurturing of fellow believers. The source of our growth is in Christ, and the means of it is by living out our lives together with other Christians. 
Uh, Jesus uses the picture of a vine. He likens himself to the vine and us as the branches in John chapter 15. We are to abide in him. When our lives are oriented in him, we also bear good fruit. But this would indicate that we are growing in him together. We need each other. That's why fellowship matters. The locus of Christ's presence is is within believers. So you need to be around other believers, right? And the final key point I want to make is we all have a role to play. If we're all equally acceptable to God and all are part of this body, and all, all of us need each other to grow, then we all have a crucial part to play. And you see this said in in numerous parts of the New Testament, and I could pick numerous scriptures that we could talk about. But one passage that really emphasizes this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, Paul says this, using the prominent metaphor of Christ's body again. Christ is like a single body, which has many parts. It's still one body, even though it's made up of different parts. In the same way, all of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, have been baptized into one body by the same spirit, and we all have been given the one spirit to drink. So see that grand idea of unity again. For the body itself is not made up of only one part, but of many parts. If the foot were to say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I'm not the eye, I don't belong to the body, that would also not keep it from being part of the body. If the whole body were just an eye, how could it hear? And if it were only an ear, how could it smell? As it is, however, God put every different part in the body just as he wanted it to be. There would not be a body if we were all only one part. As it is, there are many parts but one body. So then the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor can the head say to the feet, well, I don't need you. On the contrary, we cannot do without the parts of the body that seem to be weaker. And those parts that, we aren't, that aren't worth very much are the ones which we treat with greater care. While the parts of the body which don't look very nice are treated with special modesty, which the more beautiful parts do not need. God himself has put the body together in such a way as to give greater honour to those parts that need it. And so there is no division in the body, but all its different parts have the same concern for one another. If one part of the body suffers... All the other parts suffer with it. If one part is praised, all the other parts share in its happiness. All of you are Christ's body, and each one is part of it. In the church, God has put all in place. In the first, apostles. In the second, place, prophets. And in the third place, teachers. Then those who perform miracles, followed by those who are given the power to heal, or to help others, or direct them to speak in strange tongues. They, they are not all apostles or, or prophets or teachers. Not everyone has the power to work miracles or to heal diseases or to speak in a strange tongue or to explain what is said. Set your hearts then on the more important gifts. And then he goes on to say, and I'll tell you a greater way, and that is the way of love. So it's a really simple illustration, isn't it? Our bodies have numerous parts that have different functions But they're all vitally important. Our eyes see, our hands use objects and evade harm and other things that our hands do. Our legs move us from A to B. Our ears hear what others uh, say and and so forth. And we're all... And and so thinking about this as, as, as ourselves, as part of this body... We're all wonderfully unique. We're different personalities, giftings and abilities. So be content in who you are and use all that you are to serve the body. This is why you don't need to be envious of other people. Yes, pastors have a vital function, but they're not more important. And the moment we think that they are, we're weakening our capacity already. Do you often find yourself feeling you lack worth? That you don't have much to contribute? These are fairly normal struggles that come and go or may linger over a period of time. I tell you what, Paul was aware of it. 
which is why he makes a point of saying some parts seem less special, but they're not. You should know you matter. You have a purpose and you have an important part to contribute to God's work in this world. Some of you are naturally gifted at hospitality. Others are being generous. Others are praying for others. Others in teaching scripture, whether formally or informally. And I dare say it would be rather boring and colourless if we all had the same personality traits, the same giftings. We are meant to be different in order to complement each other. Of course, sometimes our differences can cause friction among us. So that's why we need to work harder to strive above those challenges and not see them as limiting factors, but rather as strengthening ones. The purpose is to edify God's building, the church. So it's not the quality that matters, it's the genuineness. Or you could say it this way, the quality lies in our genuineness. Our, genuine, our genuineness towards God, our genuineness in our faith, our genuineness in our love for each other. What matters is we do things in the spirit of unity and love. You belong to God's community, so may we endeavour to be a healthy, flourishing and fruitful one together in unity. Amen.